Well, welcome back to our video Bible study of the week. We are continuing the life of Christ, and today we're looking at the passage in Luke chapter 13. It is the parable of the barren fig tree. So let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we will begin. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you, Lord, that we can just open your word today and uh, learn of you and learn of this passage and, and just the importance of of walking in righteousness and bearing fruit. And Lord, we just pray that you would just guide us through it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are carrying on. We're looking at uh, the passage in Luke chapter 13. This is an interesting passage because, again, we're, we're just walking towards Jerusalem. We're walking towards the cross. There's a lot of content in these last few weeks when the Lord uh, was uh, teaching his disciples, uh, knowing what was ahead in the confrontation that was ahead. So let me pull up the passage. This is Luke chapter 13. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now that's an interesting passage because it's not recorded in any historical reference. In other words, typically there are a number of Jewish historians that we look at. Probably the most predominant is Josephus. Uh, but Josephus records nothing of this incident. So it probably wasn't a huge incident, but it was certainly something that did happen in Jerusalem. What it refers to, we really don't know. But obviously it was something that was known in the region around Jerusalem. And it's generally considered that there were a breakaway group of Galileans, Jewish people from the uh, north, from Galilee, where, where Jesus was from. Jesus was from Galilee, Nazareth, in, in that area of Capernaum. And it seems as if there was a group of these individuals from, Caper uh, from Galilee, maybe from Capernaum, maybe from Nazareth, who had rebelled and were in Jerusalem. And it seems as if, according to this, that... Uh, Pilate had them killed for their rebellion and for their rebellious actions. And in doing so, he took the blood of the victims that he had killed and he mixed it with the blood of the sacrifices of the lambs and placed it uh, on the altars. And so in essence, he was desecrating the altar, uh, but it was to put fear in the hearts of those who were involved in rebellion. What is interesting in this is that the true sacrifice who would shed its blood, that being the Lord Jesus Christ, would be approaching Pilate. And it would be Pilate who would have Christ crucified and the true sacrifice would pour out his blood. So this incident uh, talks about something that happened and it, obviously it caused a lot of a stirring and a rebellion, and, and the Jewish people were very upset that they brought it before Christ. Now, why did they bring it before Christ? Why did they bring it up? What was the purpose of that? Well, a couple possible reasons. Number one, they wanted to see what Jesus would do. Uh, he too was from Galilee, and they wanted to see if he was going to speak out against Pilate, if he was going to have some rebellious attitude. Now, remember, Galilee was under the, the region of Herod, Herod was the tetrarch of the region. He was the uh, Roman-installed kind of puppet governor of the region of Galilee. And so Pilate and Herod did not get along. In fact, the scriptures talk about the fact that they had confrontation, and this may have been one of the reasons. So Pilate had uh, these Galileans uh, put to death and then desecrated the temple, or at least the altar at that day, by mixing their blood in with the blood of the sacrifices. So what was Jesus going to say about that? Was Jesus going to cause some sort of rebellious statement that would have allowed them to accuse Christ? Jesus answered, let me pull that back up. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because of the way they suffered? I tell you, no. So, Interesting statement that Christ uh, makes here. He's saying, so are you trying to say that because they died in a very cruel, brutal way, that they were worse sinners 
as if the means of death indicates the degree of sin. And Jesus says, no, that's not how it works. In fact, he says, everybody is a sinner and everyone deserves death. And so he says, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now, this concept of repentance is critical because we know what it is. It's our salvation. Jesus had said earlier, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, repent because God's kingdom is here. Now he says, repent or be per or perish or because it, it, it is what's going to cause you to inherit what you deserve. You deserve to perish. And the degree of sin does not um, translate into the means of death. In other words, if you die peacefully in bed, that's not to say you lived a more godly life than the person who died in a very horrible way. He uses another example in verse 4. For those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the other living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now, what is this incident? We, again, don't really know of any historical uh, event of this. Probably uh, what it's talking about was Herod was building an aqueduct and this tower um, fell and collapsed, the stone tower, when the, in the building process and 18 individuals died and it was considered a tragedy. But they would say, well, what did these 18 people do that would have caused God to kill them in such a horrific way? Now, the answer is no. You know, everyone is sinners. Everyone is heading to an eternity of hell. And that's what we deserve. If God in his mercy saves anybody, it is solely an act of mercy. It's not because you deserve it. It's not because you even choose it. It, it is an act of God's grace. God saves us out of that which we deserve. We don't deserve to go to heaven. And this is the whole issue of, of election. I'll just say really quickly. If I deserved to go to heaven and God did not choose me, then God is evil and mean and unfair. But that's not the way it is. No one deserves to go to heaven. We are wicked sinners in the eyes of a holy God because of our rebellion against his holiness. And so hell is exactly what we deserve. It's not over punishment. It's not under, under punishment, it is just. And so if God in his grace saves anybody from that punishment, it is simply an act of his goodness and grace. Everyone else is just getting what they deserve and God has no need upon himself. God has no uh, mandate to save anybody, but he loves those who, according to his own grace, he chooses to love. And even though that's hard to understand, and I'll admit, it is hard to understand because we think like humans. We think that somehow I deserve or that's not fair. Um, and it is solely by faith and accepting the word of God at face value that I'm able to say, yes, I agree with that not because my humanness wants to agree with it. We are by nature, by nature, people who want to think that we deserve or I chose or it's because of me or my decision. We always want to get the my or the I into everything. That is a humanness. Um, and to b back out of that and say, God has the right to do what he wants simply because he's God and you're not, and God has the right for his own glory and purpose, according to Ephesians 1, for his own glory, reasons, and own glory's purpose. That is God's right. And I have to accept that by faith. I don't accept it because I understand it. I accept it by faith and says, this is what the word of God teaches. And God has the right to do what God wants to do. So, um, yeah, so that really is an understanding very, very quickly of the conclusion. And again, I was even a pastor serving in a church 
before I really got my mind around it, and I still don't have my mind all the way around it, but for a long time, I just had a di very difficult time understanding that, even though I was a pastor at the time. So, okay. So the fact is that the Lord Jesus says, the way you die is no indication of your sin. Now, the amazing thing in all that is there's so many Christians who believe that. They believe, oh, if I do something wrong, God is going to strike me down. Or the reason why this happened in my life is because I've done something bad. Now, it is true that God blesses those who bless him, and when we live a righteous life, he honors us. But it is wrong, wrong to think that somehow, even as a Christian, God is standing over your head with a big mallet waiting to plunk you on the head when you do something that you shouldn't do. And that the degree of your <laughs> punishment or the degree of the, the hit on the head with the hammer is proportionate to that evil thing or, or sinful thing that you committed. That's wrong to think like that because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And yes, God does discipline us, but only for the purpose of causing us to be more holy, not to punish the redeemed of the Lord. So stop believing somehow, oh, if I, if I do something wrong, God's going to strike me down. And, and believe me, there are many, 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 many people who are believers who have that wrong misunderstanding, all right? But God does honor. He honors and blesses and pours out grace and blessing, just like he honored Daniel when Daniel was in uh, Babylon and he decided not to eat of anything that was unclean and, and to trust the Lord. Uh, the God blessed him and made him mighty in the nation. So God does bless when we make a commitment to honor him. And so that's why as Christians, we need to live holy lives. Part of the reason is not just simply uh, because it's honoring to him, but part of the reason we live holy lives is because we want God to bless us. Now, we don't do it to get, but at the same time, the Lord does indeed remind us that if we want to see God's blessing in our lives, we need to uh, live lives that are holy and pleasing to him. Okay. So the Lord says, it is not true. I tell you no. We'll pull this back up. I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will perish. In other words, the only escape from perishing, and that means an eternity of death, not just simply physical death, the only means out of that is to repent. Now, repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. It is an acknowledgement of your sin, an acknowledgement of your offense to a holy God and asking the Lord to wash you and cleanse you, and turning around and not going in that direction again. And, you know, but there are so many things that are tempt us that we go back to. Uh, but the Lord's always there for us as redeemed. Uh, we do not lose, or we do not fall from grace, because we should talk, teach those passages sometimes, those two passages that talk about falling from grace. It doesn't mean we fall back to the place of being unsaved, it was a hypothetical statement saying you're trusting in the law again. You're not trusting in the grace of God. All right. So sometime we'll teach those. But we don't do that. We are God's redeemed believers. And even though I fall back and do things I should not do, um, I know that the Lord is there to forgive me. Even if I repented of it last time, I'm quite capable of saying, Lord, I'm sorry, and repenting of it again. But we do need to make a diligent effort to live holy and godly lives. As hard as that often is. All right. So the Lord says, unless you repent, you too all will perish. So he's using the illustration of those Galileans and these people who these tower fell on and just simply says they died. They died, and it may be a terrible way they died, but it's not because they deserved it more than you. You deserve it just as much. But if you repent, if you repent, you will be saved. But if you do not repent, the end result is the exact same as those individuals, whether they were the Galileans or the people who perished when the tower fell on them. They, the, the cause of death doesn't change the end result. 
Then the Lord, to illustrate that, teaches a parable. Now, this is an interesting parable. So let's pull this up again. Parable of the barren fig tree. He told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. In other words, it was a special place. It wasn't a fig tree that was growing in the, among the rocks. It wasn't a fig tree that was growing in some arid region. It was in the vineyard. It was in prime land. It was in a place where it should have flourished. It should have grown well. And so he had a fig tree in the vineyard. And he went to look for fruit, and he did not find any. Now, again, you expect to find fruit. Now, it is true that a fig tree from the time of uh, planting until it first produces uh, fruit uh, is a good number of years. And s some suggest after the tree is already mature, it takes another three years for the figs arrive on the fig tree. But the Lord is not talking about how many years it takes to grow the figs. He's talking about his ministry. Remember, from the death to his, from his, sorry, from his baptism until his crucifixion was three and one half years, half of seven. And so here it is in the middle of the seventh week or in the middle of seven in three and a half from the time of his baptism until his crucifixion, um, the Lord is looking for Israel to show some fruit. And that's what he's saying here. You are God's people. John says it this way. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he's given the right to become the children of God. That's John 1, 11 and 12. And so it is true. He came into his own, and his own received him not. Now, you remember Simeon and Anna. They were the only two in the temple. There should have been tons of people in the temple waiting for the, the birth of Messiah, but they were the only two. And where were all the other people who, who were there? And so what the Lord is saying is the nation of Israel should have had some fruit. They had all the prophets. They had all the law. They had all the messages. And yet they did not have anything that showed spiritual fruit. Now, it brings us back to the passage in Matthew chapter 3. Let me pull that up. In Matthew chapter 3, it says, When he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Keep, sorry, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit. In other words, if you're really repentant, if you want to be baptized, John the Baptist, if you really want to be baptized, then some, bear some fruit that shows that there is genuine sorrow for your sin. In other words, fruit indicates the truthfulness and the health of the tree. And so here the Lord uses this to say that reflects the nature of Israel. The nation of Israel is spiritually dead, and they want to follow corrupt ways. They reject me as the Messiah. And for three years, he's been looking for some fruit, and there's been no fruit whatsoever. And so the parable continues on in verse 7. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming looking for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up? the soil. In other words, plant something that's going to be productive. Sir, the man said, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it. And so there is the Lord just saying, look, you know what? Give it a little more time. Let the long suffering of God happen and see if they come to repentance. And that would really be the, the, the last half year and into the Pentecost and the and the beginning of the church. Let, let the nation of Israel have a little more time to see the resurrection, and hopefully they'll come around, or at least many of the Jews will come around into repentance. And so God in this parable says, even though they show no fruit, uh, hopefully by the time they see the resurrection, they will realize that I am the Messiah. Fruit indicates truth. 
Now, we know the Bible says, judge not lest you to be judged, which does not mean don't judge. It means don't judge unless you can be judged by the same standard. I've heard so many Christians say, oh, we shouldn't judge. Well, that's not really accurate. Uh, we, we should judge according to the word of God. Otherwise, how do we ever choose deacons or how do we ever choose elders? Because there's qualifications. So we, we have to. But make sure if you're going to be the one judging anyone that you're not guilty of the same thing, that you don't have a log in your eye when you're trying to pull out a sliver in somebody else's eye. But ultimately, one of the most wonderful, gracious things that the God has given to us to show the reality of those who are his is spiritual fruit. And Paul talks about that in Galatians. So let's, let me pull that passage up here in Galatians chapter 5, where indeed it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it, it, it doesn't mean that if you're an unsaved person that you lack loving your children or that you're a violent person continually, but it's talking about the, your nature that the, the, one of the aspects of the new creation is that you lose that, that bitterness and that anger and that rage. And it is true. We look at someone who says they're a, a Christian or who goes to church. The reality of whether they are genuine believers or not uh, is the fact that do they show fruit? Just like that parable. Do they show fruit that indicates that there is genuine health? And so love, not bitterness, not anger, not gossiping, not acts of rage, not demanding, not bullying. Those are the actions of a person who attends church, but is not genuinely a saved person. But rather a saved person, the Spirit of God renews him inwardly, and there is love, and there's joy, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, here, gentleness, gentleness, self-control. Unfortunately, I've, in my ministry life, have known many men who attended church for years and who were bullies. They tried to force their way. They always tried to force the church rules. They showed no fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Rather, it was bitterness, anger, gossiping, and fits of rage. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't, I just never assumed, and even now assumed that they were believers. They were just churchgoers who everybody assumed were Christians because they had been there for so many years. But, Christ knows who are his, and we can only see the fruit, but fruit indicates truth. And so the Lord says in this parable about both the nation of Israel and as well individual people that he gives us time, but in reality there must be fruit. And if there's no fruit, the tree is of no value. It is not a genuine tree. It is just a stump. And so here it is, back to the parable in Luke 13. The owner says, if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Now, what he was simply saying is, in our lives, we can't disguise spirituality. The Jews couldn't do it behind their fair sake rules. They couldn't hide it behind all the ceremony. And we can't hide it behind all of the church attendance. The truth will always be evident by the working of the Holy Spirit within someone who has renewed them. Now, as soon as I say that, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, I don't have those things. And one of the things that is often true is that when you look in a mirror, 
you don't see the fruits in your own life, but other people see them. I can see fruit in people's lives. I see people who have joy, who have peace, who have kindness. I, I see those qualities as opposed to the, the lack of those qualities. And so often other people see the fruit in you as opposed to you looking in the mirror and seeing and saying, I don't have any of those fruits. The Lord sees the fruit. It is the natural result of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord is saying in Luke chapter 13, the end is coming for all of us. What we need to do is to reveal the goodness of God in our lives, to show forth the truth of the Spirit of God that is within us, and to pray for those who are unsaved because they may not even know they are unsaved. They may not even know that they're lost. They have put all their confidence in their church attendance or their church activity. And so we need to pray, Lord, reveal it to them that they are not genuinely yours. And so let us pray, O oh Lord Jesus, let the fruit of the Spirit be seen in my life. All right? You know, when we teach these kind of passages, the first thing we always go, yeah, but what about, yeah, what about, but yeah, what about? And we have lots of what about questions. And again, the passage here is meant to be a general overall statement of truth that believers demonstrate fruit and non-believers don't. And Jesus was saying that that was true of the nation of Israel. For three years, he'd been there with them and there was no fruit, but there were individuals that were fruit. So that was a generalized statement, but he gives them more time, hoping that they'll come to repentance. All right. Okay, well, Lord bless you, and look over this passage and read it and pray through it and come to church on Sunday excited and prepared to worship the Lord. All right, Lord bless.